and help save. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session on artificial intelligence and machine learning from research to the cancer clinic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for AACR, to AACR for having us. And thank you for my colleagues who found their way to the green room. Our very first speaker, which I am so ever delighted to introduce is my co-chair on this session. Uh, Dr. Rick Stevens, who's the Associate Laboratory Director of Computing Environment and Life Sciences at the Argonne National Laboratory of the Department of Energy. Um, so let us welcome Dr. Stevens, everyone. Yay! Hello, this is Rick Stevens. And uh, I'm going to be talking for the next 20 minutes about machine learning and cancer research. I'll give an, give an overview and then talk about our drug response prediction project that we've been working on for the last four or five years. Um, first, the disclosures. Um, I'm supported by the Department of Energy National Institute for Allergies, Infectious Disease, and NIH, National Cancer Institute, Argonne, University of Chicago, and we have no other companies. So the brief outline <coughs> for today uh, is uh, I'll talk about uh, some preliminaries on AI and machine learning, uh, why deep learning is so uh, exciting uh, and applicable to this problem. I'll give some uh, discussion of the broad opportunities in cancer for machine learning, um, define personalized cancer therapy, which is uh, the primary area that we're working on. I'll talk about uh, the types of machine learning models that we build for drug response and uh, highlight some of our recent work. So in this basic form, uh, machine learning is a different way to use computers uh, to solve problems. Uh, <clears throat> and the top part of this diagram is the conventional way that we would think about uh, programming a computer where we write a program, uh, it might have some input data and we run it on the computer and it produces output. And if we want to change uh, what this computer, what this computer program can do, we have to change the program. If there's new data um, or new, some new uh, capability, we need to rewrite the program. In machine learning, uh, things operate differently. Um, we still, of course, have a computer. Uh, we typically have some large amount of data that describes our problem. And uh, in many cases, we have uh, what we call labels, where you can think of it as the output in the first case. Um, and we do a two-part process where we train models on this data, and the, uh, the models are trained to produce the output from this data to learn a function, essentially, that approximates uh, the relationship between the data and the labels. When we're finished training, we now have a new program that we call a model and we can then apply that model to new data to predict uh, the output. And uh, this second stage is called inferencing. Now, the advantage of this is that when we have new data, um, rather than having to change the program, we can go back, update this data, retrain the model, and it's good to go. So three things have <clears throat> driven recent progress in AI. Um, and made it uh, quite, uh, quite successful in many, many areas of uh, society and in science. So first of all, there, there's been a lot of good methods developed over the last 20, 30 years, um, a lot of ideas. Uh, and these methods often were limited by the available uh, quantity of training data or the performance of computers, but the underlying idea was sound. Starting about 10 years ago, it became relatively easy to produce large scale uh, data sets uh, by curating data across the internet, uh, by accumulating experimental data and uh, crowdsourced data and so forth. Um, and so it's not unusual uh, today for state-of-the-art machine learning problems to have data sets that have millions of, of samples in them. Um, and three, it's uh, uh, the availability of affordable high-performance computing and hardware, particularly uh, hardware that's based on graphics processor graphics processing units uh, has become uh, highly available 
and uh, is fast enough uh, that we can train models now. Uh, this, uh, in uh, deep learning over the last uh, particularly 10 years, uh, we can classify images, uh, recognize speech, we can translate, we can go text to speech, speech to text, um, we have all kinds of things like digital assistants. Um, we can uh, answer natural language questions. We can uh, uh, approach uh, human skill and driving in many cases, lots of game playing and so on. And in science, uh, there's been many, many applications. I don't have time to talk through them, but one that's a recent accomplishment in the last couple of years is the fact that deep learning has been able to, uh, for many cases, uh, solve essentially the protein folding problem. And this is an example of something that's been uh, very challenging for the community over, over many, many years. And now we have tools that are approaching um, this problem from, from a new perspective and are already providing useful capabilities for things like right now. So one of the reasons <coughs> that deep learning is so powerful is because unlike traditional machine learning algorithms, deep learning uh, is scalable um, in the sense that as we increase the amount of training data, we can easily expand the model capacity, which means that uh, it's less likely to be saturated, that is, a, as we have more data, and we'll see this later in some examples, uh, the more data can translate into better models. The traditional machine learning algorithms, after a while, uh, adding more data uh, typically doesn't improve the results, and uh, because they have a relatively finite model capacity. So this is one reason. Another reason is that deep learning um, is a, a type of machine learning that is relatively amenable to uh, this idea of representation learning. That is where we want the uh, system to automatically learn how to represent the data rather than having humans spend hours and months and perhaps years trying to design uh, the features to compute on. Uh, representation learning does that automatically. Um, and of course, with deep learning, we can learn multiple layers of this uh, representation um, and increasing the uh, layers of abstraction as, as we go up in the network. And this is one of the, the uh, reasons why deep learning is, is so powerful, uh, given enough data. So machine learning in cancer research has a long history. There's been many uh, projects over the years, uh, uh, a lot very large bibliography, ranging from determining uh, susceptibility to cancer. Uh, right now, a lot of progress in cancer detection diagnosis, particularly visual diagnosis. On the right here, you can see some examples from a Google project of augmenting pathologists' uh, view in a microscope uh, to provide uh, some automated assistance in segmentation, identifying uh, regions of the uh, slide that might be uh, indicating tumor cells. Uh, we see it examples of people using it to predict uh, recurrence, uh, predict uh, survival curves, uh, classifying cancers, drug response, uh, genomics, and so forth. Um, the rest of this talk, I essentially will focus on the drug response prediction as an area that we've been working on and in, in one where there's starting to be significant uh, progress. So at the heart of this problem is the concept of personalized cancer therapy, or sometimes uh, known as predictive oncology, where we want to move from a world where we treat each patient essentially the same to where we have a set of models and associated markers, biomarkers, that allow us to stratify a uh, population uh, down to the level of hopefully even the individual and associate with that particular uh, individual uh, the optimal treatment for their tumor. So it's not just the individual we're stratifying, we're also stratifying say their tumor uh, using molecular information primarily. So the models that we build um, are essentially, uh, uh, we build models that can be built for individual drugs and we build models that can generalize across drugs and across tumors. So um, we typically are trying to learn this function F where we have tumors uh, that are characterized either by gene expression or by uh, SNPs or by um, protein abundance. Um, and uh, we have drugs where we try to represent those drugs using uh, drug descriptors or fingerprints or smile strings or some other thing. And we're trying to predict their response. Um, basically, the fraction of, of growth of a typical uh, response value um, 
based on the drug and the tumor. And we can do this, uh, uh, we can swap out the uh, representations uh, with different alternative representations as necessary, and we can uh, uh, do this also for uh, drug combinations. Now, next, I'll briefly talk about highlights of our work. Study validation, that is, can our models generalize across studies um, as a kind of a prelude to generalizing uh, in the patients? Um, and what, more, what is more important in the study, the tumor diversity or maybe drug diversity? Uh, take a look at learning curves, figure out how much data we need for machine learning models um, and uh, transfer learning. So this is a very busy slide, but uh, essentially um, what we did here is we uh, took uh, five different uh, studies uh, and cell lines and uh, uh, data associated with each of these studies and we built models uh, around each study and then try to use that model to predict in other studies. This is a, a very challenging uh, thing to do. It's, it's cross, cross study validation. That is where you build a model in one study and, and validate it and it in another study. And the diagonal shows you the cases where the model is built with the same uh, study and validated in the same study. Um, and uh, the essential takeaway here is, is that uh, what we see is that um, by validating with a study other than what we, was used to create the model, we, we tend to find a floor uh, or in performance or a ceiling rather in performance that looks like around 0. 0.6 in terms of the R squared. And uh, we did a bunch of investigation to try to determine what was the cause of this. And what we concluded was that um, the independently of the machine learning technology, what limits the performance in the case of using cross-study validation is the internal consistency of models. So if you look at the green uh, box in the middle of the chart here, um, we have data from uh, studies where we, where we used uh, uh, replicates in those studies, and we can see that the uh, typical internal reproducibility in these studies is quite high, say, you know, in some cases 99%. Um, but when we look at the replicas between studies, that is, uh, when the study um, was done on the same tumor and the same drug, we find that their uh, consistency is, is much worse. And that internal consistency between studies um, here, for example, uh, shows us that the R squared is, is about 0.6, which is what we see. So essentially, the machine learning is doing the best it can, given the fact that it's got inconsistency in the data. So um, in other words, combining data from multiple studies only works if the studies are consistent. And of course, many studies that we have access to are not as consistent as we would like. Next up is learning curves where we try to understand the scale of data needed to achieve certain modeling results. And what we're interested in here is how much uh, learning from cell line studies to understand how much data we might want in a, say, a xenograph model study um, to build uh, predictive models. Uh, and what we see in these charts is that, uh, I'll show you. Um, so there's been a lot of work on this in other areas of machine learning. Um, showing that uh, as you increase the size of the data, um, typically the data set size here is on the bottom, uh, as you increase it, um, you get a reduction in error. And we see the same thing, our model is on, is on the right. Uh, so as we increase uh, the size of the data, the uh, absolute error decreases. Uh, what's interesting is if you look at this uh, to compare different modeling uh, technologies, if you compare a uh, gradient boosting type model, the red line here, uh, to a neural network model, what we see is that the gradient boosting does better up until around 2 to the 14th, something around 16,000 or 20,000 or so samples. And after that, it, it plateaus, whereas the deep learning continues to improve as we add more data. And this was what we expected from the generalized understanding of deep learning model capacity. Now, of course, I, ideally we'd like a method that would actually have a very steep uh, learning curve, um, such as the one that's outlined here in, in green, but so far we don't have uh, models that do that. 
if we get better data, we show that the, uh, in the upper right here, that the, uh, just shifting the same technology but getting slightly better data improves uh, the model results. Um, and uh, uh, on the right-hand side shows that if we have uh, uh, two data sets that are exactly the same, that we get a, a more efficient method, um, just like on the left-hand side here, that as you add more data, eventually the neural network model performs better. So neural networks can outperform classical methods uh, with enough data um, uh, and uh, bigger and bigger uh, data sets do matter um, and we'll need a breakthrough uh, in order to avoid a uh, future where we need millions of samples. This next section is on model errors. Every machine learning model makes uh, errors and we're trying to understand the nature of the errors in our models and uh, how we might improve the predictions. And by studying the classes of failures, uh, we can get some sense as to where the model's working and where the model's not working. Uh, in this particular set of examples here, I'm gonna focus on the classification form of the models. And this also feeds into uh, work that we're doing on certain quantification and other techniques to improve models. So we're trying to answer a range of questions. Um, are there some types of tumors that are harder to predict the drug response uh, than others. Uh, there's some drugs that are hard to predict. Um, are predictions uh, different, uh, the accuracy by study source? Um, can we filter training data to improve uh, the outcomes, uh, improve the ratios of false positives, true positives, for example? Um, are the types of errors the model makes in a false positive versus a false negative, are these similar? Um, and what's really driving uh, the errors? So on the right here, you can see a table. Um, this is uh, where we sorted the model's uh, uh, skill uh, using the Matthews uh, correlation coefficient. Uh, so higher is better. Um, one would be a perfect uh, prediction skill. Um, and we can see that uh, by cancer type, uh, the models that we can learn vary quite a bit uh, in, uh, in their predictive uh, skill. And, uh, you know, we try to under we want to understand what's the difference between uh, the models that perform at the top of the range versus at the uh, bottom of the range. <clears throat> to do that, we uh, look at a number of uh, um, uh, metrics. Uh, these uh, we can run on the models. So uh, on the lower left here, uh, we can see uh, what is uh, sometimes called a learning curve. It's different from learning curves we talked about before. This is a training curve, I like to call it, uh, where uh, this is the loss value, that is the uh, error, the internal error in the model as it's learning, um, and uh, blue is training, and orange is testing, and as we Epoch here is the number of iterations in, in training the model, and you can see as the number of iterations go, the model accuracy goes up and essentially plateaus. So this is a pretty good curve for a classification model. Um, <clears throat> in the middle here is our uh, confusion matrix. This is uh, uh, a way for us to tell the uh, relative uh, classes of errors that we're making. Uh, these are the true labels uh, here, and these are the predicted labels. And so we want as much of the mass to be in the uh, diagonals as possible. So this is saying that we're getting a uh, true negatives here of 0.98, which is quite good, and a true positive 0.89. Uh, false positives are quite low in a percent sense, and uh, uh, false, uh, uh, false negatives are a little bit higher. Um, but this is a very unbalanced data set. And when we look at the actual numbers of cases, we see that a large number of cases are in this true negative. Um, and but the number of cases that are in the true positive is, is quite small. There's a very large uh, difference here. And therefore, even though this error rate in the true, or sorry, in the false uh, positive is quite low from a percent standpoint, it actually represents a very large number of cases. So let me summarize uh, some of our recent work. Can we build models that are predictive drug response? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, and 
they can be validated internally on the same data sets and uh, even uh, they retain some uh, significant prediction skill when we validate uh, between cell lines. What features are most commonly used or, or are more effective? Uh, we find for tumors, uh, we use uh, gene expression, so the you know, transcription data, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, as another data type there uh, for, uh, turns out transcripts are a little better. Uh, for drugs, um, we use just descriptors and uh, some latent space uh, embeddings. Uh, more recently, we've been using images on drugs and those seem to be quite uh, effective. Can we build models that generalize across studies? Uh, yes, we've demonstrated that. And uh, we also determined that drug diversity appears to be a uh, significant uh, component of this accuracy. And of course, the scale of study is also important. How much data do we need to train drug response models? Um, our uh, recent work has shown that we need about uh, maybe 50,000 uh, high quality dose independent samples uh, for, uh, to get a, a reasonable model. Um, and this is also roughly where the deep learning models cross over uh, with the classical machine learning methods. Um, and we've also done some work, which I didn't talk about here, about uh, learning curves and uh, um, about the effect of active learning on learning curves. And um, our work has shown that uh, active learning could be an effective way of choosing experiments, but it uh, <clears throat> really requires the uh, model to be quite accurate in order for that to work. Um, and I just wanted to say that uh, this is a, represents the work of a large number of people. This is a typical uh, setting for uh, what we call hackathons, where we get our teams uh, uh, spread out across multiple institutions together every quarter uh, to work uh, side by side for a week or so. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope to be able to answer questions now. Thank you. Hi again, thank you so much, Rick, for a fantastic presentation. We have questions from the audience. And uh, one question that is especially liked um, really um, seems to be at least two different questions in one question. One is uh, regarding the inconsistency in the parameters and whether this would change the prediction of the model. Well, so the the example that I was talking about with inconsistencies are not in the parameters of the model. They're in the training data. So if training data is inconsistent, the model does its best to try to learn uh, a consistent uh, covering of, of that data. Uh, and so if you have multiple training sets that are mutually have some inconsistent data, the model can't magically learn a model that gets, that gets better than the internal consistency of the training data. So that's that, that question. Um, what it means practically is that we need to have high quality training data that's mutually internally consistent. And, that, and that's a challenge for a lot of experimental work. Uh, it means that biological replicas and uh, technical replicas you know, need to be done and you need to assess the internal consistency of your data to set your expectations right. I see, thanks. So another question um, that was part of that same very much liked question was how to predict the repurposing of a drug? Yeah, so repurposing is possible, I mean, prediction wise. Um, and again, uh, in the case of, of cancer drugs, say repurposing or out one type of cancer to another, uh, depends on, on the representation of the molecules. In our case, we use descriptors, which are small numerical quantities that are computed from the drug structure. Um, and, you're, and the label is typically a, a response, either a numerical value, um, IC50, or maybe it's a minor classification response or not a response. So um, if you have some data uh, for a given uh, disease, say, that uh, where you have examples of those uh, uh, drugs that work on that condition, then uh, you can take additional, you could build a model from that and you could then take uh, data from other drugs for which those models have never seen and attempt to predict um, 
that case. It's very similar to the drug discovery case, actually. A repurposing uh, <coughs> um, computational model is essentially a discovery model. I mean, because you can imagine that you have some data from existing drugs and you have uh, drugs that are characterized before which you have no data and you're trying to predict that. And that's essentially what our models do. So these models actually could be uh, used in the drug discovery case and the same as for repurposing. But these models are not predicting at the molecular target level. So they're not, uh, you know, trying to recover, not, they're not trying to substitute say from a, a drug, um, uh, a drug binding kind of experiment. I see. Thanks again. We have another uh, liked question uh, with a compliment. The, the audience thanks you for the fantastic introduction, Rick. Uh, would you have any comments on what ratio of samples to input dimensional? Sorry, to in input dimensionality would be required. Yeah. So there's a, a traditional uh, kind of rule of thumb that uh, says that you need to have something like 10 times the number of samples per uh, degree of freedom in your model. Um, one way to interpret that, in deep learning, this is a problem because if you interpret the degrees of freedom being the number of parameters in the model, these tend to be very large numbers of internal parameters, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of internal parameters. And having 10 times that, of course, would be great. Um, another way to interpret it is it's just 10, 10 X the in, input dimensionality. And that's probably a better rule of thumb for neural network type models. So our models uh, have a few thousand uh, input dimensions. And as I said in the, in the talk about uh, 50 K samples seems to do a pretty good job of training them. So that's, that's roughly a, a 10 X uh, ratio. Interesting. So another question is to apply models between studies, would there be an opportunity for transfer learning or any kind of fine tuning that might achieve good predictions? Yes, that, that's exactly the, the goal. <laughs> so that was, that was what we were attempting to do with this. The, pay, the results I gave here is kind of the preliminary step. So the original idea was, uh, and we're still working on this, but it's, it's uh, train on all the cell line data that you can get your hands on and then try to do transfer learning into uh, patient derived xenograph models or perhaps say organoid models, which are probably more likely. Um, and uh, we have a paper that's coming out on that topic, um, but this is at the heart of, of the issue. So if, you're, if your pre-training data is mutually inconsistent with itself, and this is, this is what we were discovering in trying to use all the cell line data, that we were getting stuck at kind of R squareds at 0.6, and that's because cell line experiments themselves aren't very consistent. Um, but if you could solve that problem, um, we see a positive impact on pre-training on cell line data and then uh, predict uh, predictions in PDX. Uh, we see a, a significant uh, boost in R squared. Um, so I believe it's possible. And I believe actually that if we move towards larger scale, say organoid based data sets that will achieve uh, even much higher uh, transfer learning from, say, organoid data to, to patient derived xenograph data. Awesome. So, do you have a sense of how much information you're getting from the drug properties? Or, in other words, how much worse would you do just generating individual predictive model for each drug? So, um, we, we do that too. Um, and um, the, it turns out that um, it, you can. Uh, build models for each drug, and they will do. Uh, they will have a range of performance values. So if you take the mean value of our models, um, and then you compare that to the models you build with individual drugs, you get a distribution of those results. So some models will be 80, 90 percent accurate with individual drugs, and some models will be down at 50, 60 percent accurate. And we're trying to understand <coughs> that that distribution actually, um, which drugs are. Um, harder to model, maybe which tumor types are harder to model. Uh, but the reason that, that we want a model, and, and for for example, if in, in, a, in a precision oncology application, you could have uh, a model for every drug, okay? And, and, uh, and you just treat it essentially as a decision procedure on the uh, decision as to whether or not to use that drug for a given patient. Um, and that fits perfectly well into a scenario where you have a fixed set of drugs and a fixed set of targets. However, if you're trying to use that model for drug discovery, 
that is where you want to train a model on what you've seen and now sweep through it many new uh, compounds that are, that are not yet uh, tested, then you need a model that generalizes in the compound space. So we think of the world as having two classes of, of model types, one that generalizes in tumor space. That's pretty much what you need for precision oncology where the set of drugs is relatively fixed. And, and what's varying over time is the tumors that you're presented with. And in the drug discovery case where you might have a panel of tumors, say a thousand tumors that you're gonna use for testing you know, large numbers of compounds, but you want a model that generalizes in the drug space. And uh, we can tune these models in either direction. Cool, I think we have time for one additional question at least, and that seems very relevant for the audience here. And this is how would you convert a model into an assay that you might be able to implement in the clinic? So um, there's several ways to think about this. Traditional uh, assays would boil down to uh, trying to find a small set of gene signatures that carry most of the predictive power of the model, maybe four or five genes, or maybe 10 genes or something like that. And then you could do a, a PCR-based assay just for those genes, say gene expression levels. It turns out that's historically what people have done, have a very small biomarker set uh, to be essentially a reduced form of the model. What we've shown, and many groups have shown this, is how, on the other hand, if you can use the entire uh, transcript profile, the models are gonna be a lot better. The problem with that in the clinic is that uh, most CLIA labs are not willing to certify an entire human transcriptome as a diagnostic tool. And so that's what we need to work on. So if you move towards the diagnostic side, you're usually limited to a handful of genes and you'll lose some predictive power of the models. Uh, if we can boost the ability to do full human transcripts as a diagnostic, um, then our models will improve significantly. Awesome. Thank you again, Rick, and thank you, the audience, for your awesome questions. Uh, we need to move on, but please feel free to still register your questions and reach out um, and tell your friends about the video. So I'm the next speaker, and uh, I guess I will let them roll my video. Thank you, AACR. Hi everyone, my name is Orly Alter and I will be talking about the discovery of genome scale predictors of survival and response to treatment with multi-tensor decompositions. Here are my disclosures and here is my contact information. Feel free to contact me with any questions. We're all familiar with omic data as a result of the Human Genome Project and working in the research lab. Omic data are now making their way into the cancer clinic. And the question remains, as it was, I guess, 20 years ago, what to do with the data? Coming from physics, we pioneered the use of the singular reality composition in modeling these data. The singular reality composition underlies the theoretical description of the physical world. For example, the physical activity of this prism that takes white light and separates it into its color components is mathematically described by the SVD. In using the SVD on large scale molecular biological data, we showed that it is able to find patterns in the data that are interpretable in terms of the known biology and the batch effects that underlie the data. So for example, here is one matrix, a two-dimensional data set with an x-axis and a y-axis. And um, the y-axis is genes, the x-axis are samples. The SVD finds for us patterns that look like genes which is um, the eigengene concept which we invented, and uh, patterns that look like sample. There is one-to-one -one correspondence between the gene patterns and the sample patterns, and these patterns are interpretable. We also showed that the generalization of the SVD are able to take, uh, to integrate different types of data together and find patterns that then can suggest previously unknown um, processes underlying the data. Um, 
we predicted a mechanism computationally in that way, and then we tested it experimentally, um, verifying it, and essentially demonstrating that the SVD and its generalizations can correctly predict previously unknown and experimentally verifiable mechanisms on the global scale, meaning the whole genome or the whole transcriptome or the interaction of the whole proteome with the genome and the transcript transcriptome, et cetera, et cetera. For um, personalized medicine and personalized cancer medicine, we then invented the comparative spectral decompositions. These are generalizations of the SVD, which look at more than a single, single two-dimensional data set, more than just one two-dimensional data set. And for example, two two-dimensional data sets for the GSVD or generalized SVD, more than two two-dimensional, any number of two-dimensional data sets, higher order data sets or tensors data where we have more than X and Y axis, also a Z axis here, for example. This is a cuboid and we can have higher order cuboids of data like that, tensors, but multiple tensors. So these are the multi-tensor decompositions in my title, and they uh, simultaneously separate the similar from the dissimilar among those multiple data sets and ultimately create a coherent model from the data by finding all these different patterns, separating the data into wavelengths in a comparative way. And to test this, we essentially looked at one of the patterns that we discovered in the data that was previously a known predictor of glioblastoma survival, and we tested it in a retrospective clinical trial experimentally and validated it. Um, so I would like to tell you about this validation of a genome-wide pattern of DNA copy number alteration that predicts survival. Just to put this in context, uh, for 70 years, the best indicator of GBM survival has been age of diagnosis. Copy number alterations have been observed in GBM tumors again and again. However, repeated attempts to associate them with a the patient outcome, such as survival or response to treatment, failed. In our analysis, we looked um, several times at different data sets from the Cancer Genome Atlas, from the same sets of patients, that's our x-axis. We looked at normal genomes, here we have them on the left, and two more genomes, here we have them on the right. And um, in this particular case, the patients are um, um, GBM, glioblastoma, or grade four astrocytoma patients, as well as lower grade astrocytoma patients, grades uh, two and three astrocytoma. And the genomes were measured with whole genome sequencing. And we can see that the tumor genomes show great variability relative to steady state. We have amplification of chromosome 7, deletion of 10, deletion of the short arm of 9. But we can also see very clearly in the X chromosome, for example, that there are normal variations between the normal um, genomes of these patients. Those normal variations are what makes our world interesting. Um, right, because we're different, we don't have the same genomes. But when we're trying to find out what is relevant to astrocytoma, we may want to separate what is normal from what is tumor, and we may want to separate it without assuming that we know everything that is normal. Well, because we don't. And the GSVD here is the perfect tool for that, <laughs> because as you can see, so the, the GSVD takes these two data sets. And like the SVD, it separates each one of them into three matrices. Again, we have patterns that look like genomes, normal, normal patterns for the normal data set, uh, tumor patterns for the tumor data set. Again, we have cores that are non-negative diagonal matrices, but with different um, numbers sitting in those diagonals for the normal data set and for the tumor data set. And we have just one set of patterns of variation across the patients that is shared in both the factorization of the normal and the tumor genomes. So what the mathematics essentially tells us 
is that there are patterns of variation across the patients, some of them with very high weights in the tumor genomes and very low weights in the normal genomes. If we look at the ratio here and we formulate an angular distance to turn this into, um, I guess, a data science tool. If we look at, at that um, uh, assessment of the, of the ratio here of the weights, we can see what is tumor exclusive mathematically. We can also figure out what is common between the tumor and the normal data sets if they have a similar ratio here between the, what the generalized singular values and the diagonals of these matrices. And we can also find what is mathematically normal, exclu um, exclusive to the normal data. So those are the mathematical, this is the mathematical assessment or the mathematical modeling of those patterns. And it turns out that just like in the case of the SVD, um, those patterns have biological meaning. So looking at three different cases from TCGA, again and again, we found the same tumor exclusive pattern in the data. First, we looked at glioblastoma patients and their genomes were measured by agilent microarrays. Then we looked at lower grade astrocytoma patients, their genomes were measured by Affymetrix microarrays. And then we looked at the whole genome sequencing data that I just showed you, and those genomes were measured by whole genome sequencing. And not only again, again, we found to zeroth order the same genomic pattern of variation across the whole genome in terms of DNA copy numbers, but this pattern again, again, correlated with a shorter, roughly one year median survival time for the patients. And these, the, obviously the um, GBM and the um, lower grade astrocytoma patients are completely um, mutually exclusive. We also had validation sets that are completely mutually exclusive. Um, those pat the pattern is not only uh, consistent in the sense that it comes up again, again, again in the GSVD of the data sets, or it's not just that the GSVD is mathematically universal in terms of that it finds the same pattern as tumor exclusive again, again, again in data that are different and have other patterns superimposed on top of it, as we will see soon. But also these maps to uh, biological pathways that make sense. Some of them were previously known. Some of them were previously unrecognized in GBM, but make sense. Um, and uh, some of them are actually analogous to artificial elements that were shown to transform normal cells into tumor cells. What are the patterns that we separate from the data? You remember we have some patterns going into different wavelengths. Well, for example, we have batch effects, batch effects that are due to GC content in the whole genome sequencing data and are exclusive to the tumor or the normal data set. We have batch effects in the Affymetrix microarray data. We have batch effects in the Agilent microarray data. Each time the batch effects are completely different and each time they are superimposed on those data sets of uh, mutually exclusive um, patients. And each time we get the same genomic pattern to more exclusive and predicting um, the survival of the patients. We also separate the nor normal variations without knowing them in advance. And specifically here we can see we're separating the um, X, chrom the, uh, X chromosome deletion relative to the autosome in the male patients. So this um, normal genotype-phenotype relationship is uncovered by the GSVD as common to the tumor and normal data set, separated into its own wavelengths. And we don't have to worry about removing, say, the X chromosome from the data before the analysis or any other part of the genome. We truly analyzed the whole genome. That enabled us to correct some gender labels in TCGA. And it's always good when you can correct the database. So databases, that's the way they are. Uh, TCGA obviously steal our awesome data.
So in our um, uh, retrospective clinical trial, we ended up with a set of 79 patients, and we were happy to be able to show and see that those patients represent the U.S. adult GBM population in terms of phenotypes of survival, uh, normal phenotypes uh, as sex, race, and ethnicity, and disease phenotypes such as age, um, which, as we said, is uh, the best um, indicator um, in clinical use uh, still today, and it has been for 70 years. Uh, we did this by comparing um, our set of patients to patients in the SEER database. We we're also able to show that the classifications based upon our pattern of the genomes in our study and the TCGA genomes um, the classifications are less, less than 1% of them are affected by the profiling technology. And we looked at all the uh, major profiling technology, right? Whole genome sequencing. We have here whole genome sequencing um, done on, on Illumina machines and uh, mapped to HG38, the Human Genome Reference 38. We have here um, sequencing done by BGI at Shenzhen on the BGI machines and uh, mapped to human genome reference um, 19. So these are very different. Um, we had Agilent and Affymetrics and Agilent was on human genome reference 18 actually. So normally experimental batch effects reduce the precision or the reproducibility of classifications by 30%, so you would expect less than 70% um, reproducibility. Here we see that we have more than 99% reproducibility in the classification. Obviously, still intratumor heterogeneity affects um, cl the classification, um, and we see the effect being limited to about 11%. Um, what we saw in the trial, which we saw in the TCGA data, is that the predictor is statistically better than an independent of the best other indicator of GBM, which is age of diagnosis. Um, and with a concordance index of uh, 78%, it has a very nice accuracy as well. This is in general, as well as in patients who receive treatment, the standard um, of care of chemotherapy, um, mostly temozolomide and radiation after resection. And um, which suggests that this predictor can also be used to assess the benefit of the treatment to the patient. Um, it is also independent of chemotherapy and radiation and post-surgical metrics such as the Karnofsky score and the per percent resection. Uh, here is the table with all of the statistics. You can see it in our paper. <laughs> um, we looked at the TCGA data again in order to um, evaluate the, the, and to show that the predictor is better than an independent of the existing pathology laboratory tests for MGMT, IDH1, and TERT. We needed to look at TCGA because there the patients were assessed in a consistent uh, manner. Uh, for our data set, we didn't really have this information very consistently and for extremely a small number out of the 79 patients. Um, and I want to note that uh, all these predictors, not only they're single gene predictors, whereas we look at the whole genome, right? But also they um, have been predictors in other tumors before they progressed to standard of care in glioblastoma. So we hope to be able to improve the, the plans to improve the prognostic, diagnostics, and therapeutics with this genome-wide predictor of survival. And this is the first predictor, I want to say, that encompasses the whole tumor genome. The prognostic classification can, can help in managing particular situations when um, the doctors need to decide about um, intervention or waiting a little bit before intervention. The diagnostic classification can help drugs process to regulatory approval. Um, obviously, it's the whole genome and just, not just a targeted drug that um, could suggest the response of a patient 
to a drug, even if the drug targets just one gene. For example, even in mice, it's already been known uh, for a while that the effect of EGFR deficiency depends upon the background. Possibly, it's not surprising then that when you're looking at um, EGFR inhibitor in clinical trial, the effect of the inhibitor um, is such that maybe it helps some of the patients, but it is impossible to figure out who are these patients based upon in advance based upon the tumor's EGFR amplification alone. And um, we even have therapeutic predictions, not just of targets that sit very nicely in the pathway diagram that comes with the genome-wide pattern, but also um, specifically druggable targets that uh, we can tell are on their own correlated with survival. So both those um, aspects make them possibly more promising targets. I want to emphasize that the patient survival is the outcome of their tumor's whole genome, not just parts of the genome. Take, say, chromosome 10 deletion. We see it in the tumor profile that's most correlated with the pattern, but we also see it with the tumor profile that's among the least correlated with the, pro with the pattern and um, is actually classified to the low correlation group that has um, longer median survival. And this is a proof of principle that those comparative spectral decompositions that we developed are suitable for um, discovering clinically actionable, accurate, and precise genotype-phenotype relationships. To do that, they overcame um, several, um, three challenges, finding patterns across whole genomes of 3 billion nucleotides, finding patterns simultaneously across tumor and normal genomes without simplifying the complex structure of the data, and doing that in small cohorts of patients, which are typical in clinical trials. And I want to mention that there are so very few copy number variation associations with disease relative to SNP association with disease even though copy number variations are much more prevalent in our genome and are implicated in both normal and tumor development. So these, these comparative spectral decompositions definitely solve a, an existing problem. Uh, this, this is just to impress upon you that yes, we need to formulate um, theorems and prove the theorems, for example, an eigenvalue inequality on the way to developing these um, comparative spectral decompositions. And here to impress upon you that we have results for more than glioblastoma. We have results for adenocarcinomas, specifically the benefit of platinum um, in terms of overall, overall survival past the primary treatment. We hope that this will lead to a theory, but either way, you got to agree that we, these uh, comparative spectral decompositions find in the data um, things that other methods don't. And I want to thank my collaborators and the support of the NCI's Physical Sciences in Oncology Network, and thank you. Thanks, Orly, for that great talk. Um, we have some questions from the audience, and uh, why don't we start with uh, the first question, which is, uh, what is the difference uh, between PCA and tensor decomposition? Uh, thanks, Rick. Yeah, um, so people usually think of PCA as being similar to the matrix decomposition, which is the singular value decomposition. The singular value decomposition on its own, which is a matrix decomposition, it's used for stably computing PCA or principal component analysis, but already there, it's not the same. It actually enables us to do things that PCA on its own cannot do. And um, I'm happy to go into the details, but just very briefly, um, yeah, you know, the PCA assumes particular pre-processing of the data from the statistical point of view. A PCA identifies patterns not across columns and rows of the data set simultaneously, but differently. 
Whereas we're looking at the correspondence of these patterns in order to interpret the data. And um, PCA, well, at least the way it's uh, programmed in most computational packages is limited to looking at just the first uh, two or three patterns that captures most of the information in the data. Um, okay, well, I guess that's good. I think that's good for now. Let's, we have a couple other questions that we wanna make sure we have time for here. So okay. um, the, next, the next question is, is really about batch effects. Can you use okay. this technique to remove batch effects? Uh, sure, totally. Uh, that's essentially what we're doing. We're not only identifying what is tumor exclusive and relevant to the tumor biology, we're also identifying what is a tumor exclusive and is relevant to the effect, in this case, guanine cytosine, say, um, uh, abundance levels across the genome, which is known to be uh, affecting, um, the, the, which is known to be superimposed on all genome sequencing results, especially when there is a DNA amplification involved. Uh, so yes, we're identifying uh, uh, batch effects and we're separating them. We've actually seen it all the way going back to the SVD for a single matrix work, and we're seeing it here now when we're looking at the generalized SVD for two matrices and any kind of tensor or decomposition that builds on the SVD that looks at more than uh, one data set and looks at more than two axes in the data, so tensors. So another question is, um, you mentioned the whole genome. Um, so um, the, the question is, why include the whole genome when, uh, quote, most of the genome isn't predictive? Well, uh, uh, thanks for the question. Actually, we'd argue that really the whole genome is predictive. If you're even trying to just look at uh, our pattern and just look at uh, chunks of the patterns, and uh, I think I tried to allude to that, say uh, just chromosome 10, which is usually deleted, chromosome seven, which is usually amplified, um, the short arm of nine. If you're, you're trying to start to look at those areas in the genome, you find that actually um, those on their own are not predictive of survival and response to treatment. It really is the whole genome. At the same time, um, the level of coverage of the whole genome that one might need may not be that very deep. For example, in our clinical trial, we looked at uh, 30x coverage of the whole genome sequences. And uh, when we looked earlier at Agilent and Affymetrics um, microarrays, obviously they didn't look at the whole genome um, in the sense that it, it, they didn't look at very uh, deep coverage of the whole genome, but they did uh, sparsely um, assay the whole genome, including regions that are not necessarily encoding for genes. Okay, great. Um, there's another question. Are there plans to implement a model like this for relapsed glioblastoma patients? Oh, that's a fantastic question. And you know what? I'll make it a plan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, <that's good. laughs> All right. Uh, great one. We have another question, which is, uh, please describe again what you know of the pathways implicated by the canonical copy number variation signature. Okay. So... Uh, the, the pathways that we found for glioblastoma are um, three main pathways. There is uh, the RAS um, signaling pathway, which has already been known to be involved in glioblastoma for the most part. We also see in our patterns, in our pattern contributions from the sonic hedgehog uh, signaling pathway and sonic hedgehog, it's an interesting pathway. One of the components of the pathway is this gene GLI-1, which amplification was first observed in GBM, but uh, very quickly um, research has moved into looking at uh, the effect of this pathway in medulloblastoma, where it is uh, being targeted in clinical trials today. So um, while it's been first observed in GBM, really it's been thought to affect mainly medulloblastoma, but we see that pathway very prominently as part of our, part, our pattern and uh, cooperating with the RAS pathway in order to prevent cell cycle arrest, prevent apoptosis, prevent senescence, and enable the tumor cells, the GBM tumor cells to continue 
to replicate. A another pathway that we found where the changes were mainly in the non-coding regions, actually in the promoting promoter regions of the genes is the notch pathway. And again, notch is mainly thought of to be relevant for neuroblastoma, but what do you know, it seems it's very much relevant for GBM as well. And in fact, it enables uh, what you might think of as some kind of a crosstalk between the uh, sonic hedgehog and the RAS pathways. Great, I think, uh, I don't know, we have maybe one more question. That's almost one minute here, but more of a philosophical question from the audience. How broad a reading should computational biology trainees do so they can adapt these physics principles to biology data analysis? Oh, <laughs> um, how broad a reading? I don't know, you know, what I would say is if you're um, actually, so. If you come from not physics, maybe really what interests you is the question that you want to answer. And actually even coming from physics, what interests you is the question. And then based upon the question, you just go do the readings. Um, if you have any kind of background that's not directly from computational biology, I would say definitely do not abandon it when you approach the question. Definitely remember that background because ultimately everything can help. I, I guess the, the recent word for this is convergence. Okay, great. I think we're ready for the next speaker now. Um, I'm gonna hand it back to Orly since I can't remember who's the next speaker is. <laughs> it's oh. Guy or Ron. <laughs> <laughs> it's Ron, well, thank okay, you Ron. so much, Rick. Um, so our next speaker is Ron Anafi from the University of Pennsylvania. And he'll speak about identifying targets for cancer chronotherapy with unsupervised machine learning. Thanks, Early. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Ron Anafi, and welcome to my dining room. I have no conflicts. Daily rhythms in biology are found throughout nature. Life evolved on a rotating planet, and organisms that could not only respond to daily environmental changes, but predict and anticipate them would be at a selective advantage. The Hoganesh lab, where I did my postdoctoral work, did a time course collection of 12 mouse tissues and found that about half of all expressed mouse genes showed significant daily oscillations in at least one of those 12 tissues. But one of the other lessons of their work was that while the core molecular oscillator that drives those circadian rhythms is common throughout those tissues, the individual outputs, in other words, which genes cycle changes dramatically from tissue to tissue. What my heart does at 12 o'clock is very different from my lung and my big toe. When my lab reanalyzed that data at a pathway level, we found that pathways related to cell cycle, DNA replication, and immune pathways directly relevant to cancer biology and cancer treatment showed widespread circadian regulation across tissues. Simply put, Cancer therapies aim to kill cancer cells while sparing surrounding normal tissue. Over the course of the last two or three decades, dedicated physician scientists have noticed that various treatments have different efficacies or toxicities at different times of day. And here I'd refer you to the excellent work of Francis Levy and some of his colleagues. Um, and it's likely from their work and the work of others that molecular circadian oscillations underlie these treatment related changes. And if we knew which drug targets and which molecules change with time of day, we would be better able to identify rational targets for cancer chronotherapy. But while there's been a rapid explosion in our knowledge of circadian molecular biology, the translation to clinical medicine and chronotherapy has been far slower. And in particular, there are key knowledge gaps that are present preventing that translation. We know what cycles in one strain of mouse across its body, but what about in our bodies? And what happens, what changes in those rhythms when we get sick? And that knowledge gap is not an accident. That is the exact sort of information that is practically impossible to obtain from classic circadian biologic experimentation. Unlike mice, I can't take a group of people kill one an hour and harvest their livers. It is practically impossible to get temporally ordered human tissue, and even harder than that to get it from patients 
If we could get that data, there's a lot more variability between human beings, both in their environment and their genetic background, that would make these same experiments harder to interpret. But there is a lot of patient data. Unfortunately, the time at which it was obtained or sampled is almost never reported. So the question is, can we use unordered molecular data to identify molecular rhythms? The more common approach to this sort of problem is a supervised learning approach, where one collects a training set, a set of examples that demonstrates what the molecular features look like in a given tissue at different times of day. And then when we obtain a new sample, we can say, ah, this looks like a two or a three o'clock sample. This is not a new idea. Carlos Linnaeus, the biologist who gave us genus and species, had a very similar idea, but not looking at transcription, rather at flowers. Linnaeus recognized, like many biologists before him, that different flowers opened and closed at different times of day. He reasoned that if he selected the right flowers, found the right features, he could plant a garden and by looking at it, say, the roses are open, the daffodils are closed, must be 3.30. The problem with this sort of approach for our purposes are twofold. First, as I mentioned, that sort of training data, that sort of time-stamped human data is very hard to obtain. But also it's worth noting that the, there's very different rhythms between my different tissues. So a pattern I learned for the heart, for example, is very unlikely to work when I'm trying to evaluate a new liver sample. In other words, a flower garden that I plant in Ecuador is unlikely to live or tell time in Canada. So we tried a different unsupervised approach where the data itself is trying to show us an ordering. That sounds a little crazy, but the underlying intuition is pretty simple. Imagine you have just two oscillating genes that are 90 degrees out of phase with each other. That is, as gene one is near its peak expression, gene two is sort of midway, and as gene one begins to come down in expression, gene two slowly increases. If you were to plot gene one against gene two as a function of time, they would make this spiral, this slinky. And if you were to randomize this temporal order and replot the data, you'd find the data still has structure. It now lives, instead of on a spiral, on a cylinder. In fact, if you were to suppress time altogether and just plot gene one as a function of gene two, the data would lie on a circle. For those of you who are more mathematically inclined, if gene one was sine of time and gene two cosine of time, if you plot gene one versus gene two, that plot will always look like a circle, no matter what order you obtained the data. Here, we don't have just two genes that have a common period, but hundreds or even thousands of genes that cycle with a circadian rhythm. So the task effectively boils down to identifying a circle in noisy, high-dimensional data. To do this, we use an autoencoding neural network, a neural network that attempts to optimally encode uh, and compress the data. But here we force an encoding to, that lies on a single circle. So the machine learning algorithm is forced to identify the circle uh, in the high dimensional data that best captures its variance, that best describes the whole structure of the data. And once we've identified that circle, we can go back and for any given sample, identify where in the circle it comes from what circadian phase it arises from. Here we can see the circle that was reconstructed when the network was fed time course transcriptomic data describing mouse liver. And in particular, if we compare the angle on the circle with the true time of collection or sample collection, we can see that they're very well correlated so that the cyclops phase provides an excellent surrogate measure for circadian time. We next wanted to evaluate cyclops using noisy human transcriptional data. So we turned to the molecular transcriptomic data of Chenidal, who analyzed cortical human brain samples obtained at autopsy. Feeding the cyclops autoencoder this molecular data, we again find that the cyclops angular molecular phase provides an excellent surrogate for the true hour of death. Um, and in particular, if we were to evaluate the expression of individual genes as a function of either hour of death or cyclops phase, 
we find that genes that were rhythmic with respect to time of death were also rhythmic with respect to cyclops phase, while genes that were arrhythmic with respect to circadian time or hour of death appeared arrhythmic with respect to cyclops phase. It's important to note that while when we applied cyclops to the mouse, we could uh, feed it all transcripts, when we applied it to the human, we had to first restrict the set of features that were analyzed, looking at genes that we thought were highly likely to cycle based on their homology to mouse genes and what we knew cycled in that species. Of course, our ultimate goal is to apply this cyclops technique uh, when we don't know the true time of sample collection or the true time of death. So how should we know if we should have confidence in the ordering that Cyclops provides? Well, I have to admit that's not a problem that we fully licked, but we can compute metrics and look to certain biological knowledge to reassure us about a Cyclops ordering. We can check to see if the circular structure that the Cyclops program identifies really explains a significant uh, variance of the data. We can look to see if the period periodic ordering that's reconstructed is smooth um, and if the results are internally consistent or robust to small changes. But also, and perhaps most importantly, we can look to see if the circadian ordering that this uh, uh, program reconstructs reproduces known molecular physiology. That is from the mouse and the fly and lots of conserved molecular biology. We know the relationship between the genes in the core circadian clock, and we can expect to see certain genes precede other genes in a particularly repeatable rhythmic order. And none of that information is directly input into Cyclops. So we can assess to see if the ordering that Cyclops gives us is consistent with that known molecular physiology. So how can we use this to learn something new? We first analyzed human lung biopsy data, uh, particularly focusing on a large study where 500 non, about 500 non-cancerous biopsies were collected in two sites in Canada and one in the Netherlands. And I'm in particular going to focus on uh, two of those sites, one in Quebec and one in Groningen. The molecular rhythms reconstructed by Cyclops using either the Laval or the Groningen data were remarkably similar. And in particular, the oscillations and patterns we saw in the core clock genes well reflected what we expected to see from known molecular physiology. We wondered if we could do this at all, knowing that surgeons only work on average from around six in the morning to six at night, and wondering if we would have any samples to reflect the nighttime half of the circle. When we look at the orderings that Cyclops created, we find that it described about 20% of the samples to one half of the 24 hour period and the other 80% to the other. We think this reflects the fact that about 20% of the population in both the Netherlands and Canada are shift workers, so that daytime samples obtained from that population reflect nighttime biology. But again, if we were to look individually at each gene and identify its acrophase, in other words, the time of day that it peaks in the Netherlands, we get very consistent results when we look at that same gene's peak time in Laval. So while our results might be wrong, at least they're consistently wrong. And once we identified the individual genes and transcripts that oscillate with a daily rhythm, we could look to find uh, annotated pathways that showed orchestrated or synchronized transcription across the circadian day. And again, in the lung, in the human lung, as in the mouse, many of the um, pathways most important to cancer, like cell cycle and DNA replication, um, showed strong circadian synchronization. The pathways highlighted in yellow uh, were found to show circadian orchestra orchestration both in the mouse and in the human lung. Working with Mark Rubin, John Huganesh, and other colleagues, we applied this same Cyclops approach to an earlier draft of the GTEx database, identifying transcriptional rhythms throughout the human body. As GTEx expands and our technology and the ordering process improves, as I'll show you, I think this data is actually getting better. But how do we use this to look at disease, and in particular, cancer? Here again, we begin with a large single center trial, and in particular, the work at Lam of Lam et al., who is looking at hepatocellular carcinoma.
And this data set was particularly useful because they had transcriptional data both from the normal margin and from the cancer itself. And we were able to construct and compare rhythms in the margin tissue with the rhythms in the cancer. Interestingly, the core circadian clock seemed to show rhythms in both the cancer and the normal tissue. And here you can see the reconstructed rhythms of several of the core clock genes. But if we look at different clock outputs, we can see that while several of them had strong, out, strong rhythms in the normal tissue, rhythms were lost, or at least the amplitude much reduced for certain genes uh, or transcripts in the cancerous tissue. Now, to me at least, uh, the persistence of rhythms in the core molecular clock of the HCC samples was a bit of a surprise. In part, this was because there had been long-standing data that the circadian clock gates the cell cycle, and uncontrolled cell division would suggest a non-functioning circadian clock. But, as I said, our data suggested that there was still clear rhythms in the core clock of the HCC samples. However, if we focused in on the transcripts that were rhythmic in, norm, in the normal liver margins and compared their amplitude of cycling in the uh, cancerous tumor versus the normal margin, we found that for most of the transcripts, their amplitude was relatively unchanged, but there was a long tail of transcripts that had lost circadian rhythmicity in the HCC samples. And when we analyzed those transcripts, at the pathway level, we found that many of them uh, reflected apoptotic and p53 pathway genes, suggesting that this might be a mechanism for the ACC samples to escape circadian regulation. So how can we use this sort of information to guide chronotherapy? Well, at this point, We've only done some proof of concept experiments, but I'd like to show you how we think this can progress. Now, streptozocin is a cytotoxic agent that is transported into cells via the GLUT2 transporter and is used as a treatment in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Unfortunately, its use as a treatment is limited by both liver and kidney toxicity. And in looking at our reconstructed human data, we saw that there was a strong cycling of the GLUT2 transcript in the liver and also in the kidney. And in particular, you can see that its expression goes from near zero to, to quite high. When we went back and looked at the mouse data, we found almost the same pattern, which made us wonder if we dosed streptozocin at the right time, if we could mitigate this toxicity. And the use of streptozocin in this trial um, was particularly uh, exciting because it had a very fast kinetics. It had a very short half-life. So it, uh, we thought it would be a great proof of concept drug for testing the principles of cancer chronotherapy. Now, we began not looking at a cancer model, but a normal mice, but we were able to assess the efficacy of a streptozocin in terms of killing pancreatic, normal pancreatic cells uh, and effectively giving the mice diabetes. And what you can see is that regardless of whether we gave uh, streptozocin in the morning or the evening, uh, over time, uh, the, the mice developed diabetes, their pancreatic cells, uh, neuroendocrine cells died, whereas if they were given saline, regardless of the time, uh, there was no change in their blood glucose. However, if we look at their gross body weight, just as a measure of the general tox the global toxicity of the agent, we can see if they were given streptozocin in the morning as opposed to in the evening, they lost much more weight and actually appeared much sicker. Again, proving just as a proof of concept that if we, we might be able to segregate the efficacy and the toxicity of this agent using our knowledge of the underlying molecular biology. Now, before uh, coronavirus closed our lab, working with John Hoganesh, we were trying to do a lot more detailed experiments, trying to get a better glimpse into the uh, optimal dosing window and also looking now at mouse models of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Of course, those experiments are now at hold, but using those and other drug therapies, we're trying to uh, better experimentally validate the principles of cancer chronotherapy and measure both transcription and protein uh, as a function of time.
So I clearly am not a cancer researcher. So how can you use this to advance the field of cancer chronotherapy? Well, the Hogan Esch lab maintains a database, CircaDB, publicly accessible, that will display rhythms of your gene or, t uh, or in your tissue of interest, either uh, looking at mouse time course collected data or reconstructed rhythms from human data using cyclops. My lab maintains a GitHub repository uh, where Cyclops is available for download, along with other algorithms for rhythm analysis and detection. And finally, I'd also like to po point out the circadi circadiomics website maintained by the Baldy Lab at UCI, which not only has some of the same transcriptomic data, but has circadian metabolomic and proteomic data uh, available from mouse and also baboons. So how are we making the circadian data ordering process better? Well, one of the first things that we're doing and one of the things that's most relevant to cancer research is allowing Cyclops to handle non-circadian confounds or non-circadian sources of genetic and transcriptional variation. As I mentioned, Cyclops, is, as it is structured now, tries to ascribe all sources of variation of the data to a circadian pattern. And of course, there's a lot of other sources of variability cancer heterogeneity, data processing site. And if we look at data um, like that available in GTEx or that available in the Cancer Tissue Genome Atlas, we see that often batch processing site provides a, a significant source of variability. In the previous iteration of Cyclops, we had to look at data from each site separately, and that was often a limiting factor. But Jan Hammerland, a grad student I'm working with, has been working on expanding the Cyclops network so that it can account for known confounders, including batch processing site or uh, molecular tissue, uh, molecular cancer biomarkers. So while Cyclops clearly has its difficulties, it's an intense, computationally intensive process and requires a lot of samples. I hope I've shown you that that idea or similar ideas might be very important in transitioning us and providing background data to advance the ideas of cancer chronotherapy. Jan and I are also working to use Cyclops and uh, related approaches to characterize the strength of, circadian, of the circadian oscillator in individual samples to see if that has any prognostic information. I also wanted to highlight some alternative approaches to understanding circadian biology in cancer. Now, I mentioned that the core circadian clock is well conserved among tissues and that there is a consistent order among these genes. And for example, the genes clock and B male tend to go up together and uh, are antagonized or repressed by the genes cry and purr. So that if you were to look at a correlation, clock and BMEL are often very well positively correlated, while clock and cry or purr are negatively correlated. Jake Yui and his colleagues have used this block correlation structure as a marker for intact circadian function. If you look here at this uh, correlogram of normal skin, you can see that there's some circadian genes in the core clock that are very well positively correlated and then anti-correlated to others. And Jake and his colleagues have looked, uh, as again I've said, have looked at other tissues to look for preservation of this structure and argued that when it's lost, it's prima facie evidence of circadian disruption in tumors. Of course, there can be other non-circadian sources of variation, such as tumor heterogeneity, that may be obscuring the sim signal. And at the other hand, there can be times where we see positively and negatively correlated genes that don't reflect an underlying rhythm. But the idea that this pattern can be used as a preliminary screening tool uh, seems like it could be a powerful one. On the other hand, David Rand, Francis Levy, and their colleagues have an approach that I would argue is, is very much like Cyclops in its intuition, but rather than using a net, neural network, attempts to solve the same problem using a probabilistic framework. So in summary, uh, unsupervised or semi-supervised uh, methods can help bridge the gap from elegant circadian biology to the translation to cancer chronotherapy. The intuitions behind these uh, methods are actually pretty simple, but their implementation can be difficult, and there are a lot of groups that are working to make it better. In the meantime, time course data in mice and reconstructed rhythms in humans are easily available to cancer, re uh, to cancer researchers, re researchers, as is uh, some of the software available for doing your own analysis.
in that these approaches bring with them a lot of exciting challenges and opportunities that we can learn with Cyclops or other approaches, uh, the rhythms in both normal and cancerous tissues, and that even those normal rhythms can be actionable for clinical researchers, at least in terms of mitigating toxicity, and that especially if we put this these data into your hands. And that if we combine that knowledge with the knowledge of pharmacodynamics, we can identify some of the most promising candidates and speed their path towards clinical trials and chronotherapy. And ideally, we'd love in the long term to use this information and really connect it to our biomedical knowledge and our understanding of cancer. And in the long term, really learn what's going on in any given patient in the tissue of interest. What time is it? in my patient with this tumor and in, in, in this, this tissue. Um, in the end, I ultimately just want to thank a lot of the people who did some of this work. As I mentioned, Jan Tomerland in my own lab and some great collaborators in Junyun Kim at Penn and John Hoganesh in Cincinnati who have contributed a lot of the reagents, a lot of the work, and on really a lot of the best ideas. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Ron. We have uh, questions from the audience. The audience also very much enjoyed the webinar, I should note. And uh, the first question is, is it a concern that other cellular processes like the cell cycle also manifest as a circle? So, so that's a great question. And, and there's a couple of parts to it. So one, uh, if we're just trying to find data that, that maps onto a circle, as, as the audience member is suggesting, there's nothing in Cyclops itself that really forces us to look for a circadian rhythm. So it, we can use the same approach to look for other rhythms. Um, and honestly, we know that the cell cycle and the circadian clock in most somatic, nor healthy somatic tissues are actually coupled so that they likely share the same rhythm. But if we were to seed uh, let's say we knew that there was a process that had a very different period and we were to focus on those genes, they would likely lie on a different circle than the, the, the circadian genes. And in fact, if we construct networks that allow for two or three circles, we can often sometimes deconvolve these patterns. And we'd actually like to use that to look for new rhythms that we're unaware of. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question, was about the possibility of integrating um, other circadian rhythms, um, specifically in other omic level data, for example, metabolites. Um, so the, the, uh, the person who asked the question would very much like to know if you could integrate the metabolomic um, Cir uh, circadian rhythms together with say gene expression, circadian rhythms, um, especially when it comes to cancer therapy? So that's a great question. Uh, and so one, I would agree, there's a lot more than just gene expression. There's, there's protein level stuff. And then there's metabolism, which has some of the strongest rhythms. So one, can we analyze meta metabolomic data in the same way? I think we can, and, and we've done some work towards that effect. When you ask a question about more integrating it though, there you have a question of what do you mean? Mechanistically, we could say, you know, a certain enzyme goes up at a certain, you know, the transcript for an enzyme goes up at a certain time and then its protein is made and then it may catalyze a reaction. So there can be mechanistic construction, uh, you know, connections or just analyzing it all at once. We can clearly analyze it all at once and look for, for rhythms at these different levels. Um, getting a cogent biological interpretation is something that's a little harder, but clearly thing, something that people are working towards. Cool. So how many data points are needed to properly find oscillations? I try uh, and avoid answering that question because I don't know. <laughs> uh, but th there's a reason I, I, I avoid it. So one, if a tissue or a tumor has much stronger rhythms, it's easier to see. So that's one sort of factor that goes into it. Another factor that goes into it is how are the samples obtained? So if you're looking at autopsy data where you have data from across the, you know, people die across the 24 hour period, we'll, we, you know, we get an easy representation of the entire circle. Whereas if we're looking at biopsies, it's heavily weighted towards one part of the day as opposed to another. And so we need to collect a whole lot of samples just to have enough to fill out the, uh, the second half of the circle. So typically uh, in sort of biopsy situations, 
we're, we're, we're not even beginning to look until we hit somewhere on the order of 200 or more samples. But hopefully as we get better at this, we might get a, a um, I might have a, a, a more concrete answer to that question. Cool. So two really quick questions, I hope. Um, how about uh, phase shifts between RNA and proteins and are they specifically relevant for a cancer chronobiology? Can you, can you somehow comment on that? And the other last question is, how about integrating cyclops into TCGA? So two great questions. Uh, so the first is the phase shifts, the difference between protein and, and transcript is clearly important. I will say that the clock genes, those transcripts based on certain physical principles that, you know, you, they have to be relatively short half-life uh, molecules. And it turns out that there's a relatively small sort of four, sort of on average four hour difference between when a transcript peaks and its and corresponding protein. But that's just for these sort of core clock genes. For the outputs, it very much changes from, from gene to gene and protein to protein. And in fact, the one example I gave of streptozosin and GLUT2, there was actually a, a close to 12 hour difference between the, the transcript and the protein. So if you dosed it based on transcript time, you would have been absolutely wrong. So keeping those, uh, being aware of that biology is important. And in terms of applying this to TCGA, that's exactly what we'd like to do, but we didn't feel we were comfortable, uh, capable of doing it until we were better able to deal with some of the confounding effects like batch effects that you were sort of eloquently talking about in your last, uh, in your presentation. So that we're working our way up to that. Awesome, thank you so very much, Ron. And our next speaker is going to be also an MD. This is Dr. Guy Fish from Celanix, and he will talk about stratifying patients by live cell biomarkers with random forest decision trees. Welcome. Hi, I'm Guy Fish, CEO of Cellnex Diagnostics, and I'd like to take you through the journey that we've had in developing AI for clinical applications. Um, as you'll see, uh, the um, home version of the AACR meeting is going to be met with a few technical challenges, so please bear with me. Uh, I'm sharing my screen now, which um, presents first slide, um, my uh, disclaimers. I am, uh, as mentioned, CEO uh, of Cellinex Diagnostics and uh, a board member and shareholder. I'm also chairman of the board of uh, trustees at Altarum Institute, uh, a think tank and government contract worker. And at Ediometry, uh, I'm an independent director and shareholder. So uh, the application of AI to um, clinical work is quite timely. Um, despite 20 billion in annual spend on cancer, um, there are still some very important clinical questions that remain. How aggressive is my cancer? Um, will it recur? Must I risk treatment complications? What is it sensitive to and what treatments won't work? Do I need to treat it? Stepping back and, and looking at this, this problem from an academic perspective, uh, Dr. Shivastava in um, his paper, um, in 2019, very clearly calls out for a different type of approach to diagnosing and treating. He says that we are grossly over-diagnosing and over-treating um, cancers. He's begging for a tool to distinguish aggressive from indolent disease. We know it's there, but does, do we really have to treat it? And we, are we over-treating? Similarly, uh, specific to prostate cancer, Dr. Alshak, concludes that we need better risk stratification tools to guide cancer therapy. And so that is our goal, stratification. I'll take you through the Cellnex journey, which starts with uh, publication in uh, 2018 uh, of our platform, and then our early technical results, and then our clinical trial results. So like all journeys, it starts with a simple question. Um, why are we looking at dead cells when living cells can tell you so much more? It, really, it's not about the histology, it's the biology that we want to know. Is it an aggressive tumor or not? 
The traditional way of looking at it is to do uh, microscopic pathology, formal and fixed tissues and, and, and of non-living cells. But we think we can get to increased information content if we go to what's possible, and that is the um, looking at primary tumor cells that have been cultured and examined. And that's really the key. Pri getting to culture primary tumor cells is pretty hard. But at Stellanex, we've been able to, to pull that off. And this is what you see when you culture primary tumor cells and allow them to sit in a culture medium. Uh, we can watch, track, and follow their behavior, and therein is the difference. Observed behavior con con uh, creates deep insights that are very different than genomic biomarkers, which are static and upstream. These are phenotypic biomarkers. And so by way of analogy, imagine yourself at the beach one day and you see this scene or the scene on the right. And it looks like a day you might be able to wait out and maybe have a little fun with your kid. Uh, but then uh, after getting the postcard of this place, you get there and this is what you see. It's very different looking at a dynamic picture than looking at a static picture. Uh, that is not necessarily a day that you want to put your dog or your child in the beach on. Uh, so that is what Selenex is focusing on. We are focusing on the ability to uh, determine significant pathological features of either local pathology or metastatic potential. On the local side for prostate cancer, has it gotten into the seminal vesicle? Uh, is the extra prostatic margins going to be breached? Um, and are, are there positive surgical margins? In metastatic potential, how about perineural invasion, lymph node positivity, or lymphovascular invasion? We can, in essence, predict these things by looking at the behavior of living cells in terms of tortuosity, cell dynamics, membrane dynamics, and spreading. This was published in our seminal paper in the fall of 2018 uh, in Nature, um, Biomechanical Engineering, Biomedical Engineering. Live cell phenotypic biomarker micro microfluidic assay for the risk stratification of cancer patients by machine learning. And so the article describes our rationale, the clinical utility, our means and methods, and early results for 57 prostate and 47 breast cancer subjects. Taking you, through, taking you through it quickly, there are a host of reasons why the Cellnex plat is technology as a platform. Uh, we have ways of culturing primary tumor cells, associating the tissue and harvesting them, uh, preparing glass and composite surfaces for uh, the cell culture and uh, for uh, depositing the, the primary cells, and then using machine vision to observe these cells and acquire data on their biomarkers. Um, we add to it some, a small number of fixed cell biomarkers, and then we use machine learning on these data to train and be able to predict in new patients uh, in our study set the correlation to the biomarkers and the pathology that we are interested in. So how do we do this? Um, our methodology starts, as you see in A, uh, with uh, a biopsy that's been taken of a gland or suspected tumor site. Uh, we receive for prostate cancer a core, and we dissociate that uh, and normalize those cells, and then load them onto our extracellular membrane uh, to get them to culture out over 24 to 48 hours. We then image these cells on a um, differential interference contrast microscope, uh, accumulate uh, large data sets. So for each cell, if we're looking at somewhere between 100 to 600 biomarkers over somewhere between 2,000 to 5,000 cells over some 25 to 30 time points, that's a database of approximately 20 to 40 million elements, which is then fed into our machine learning statistical algorithms. Uh, the features that we're looking for are detailed in our art, in our journal publication, Nature uh, Biomedical Engineering. Um, we are looking for mean cell spreading, uh, mean migration, mean tortuosity, 
mean retrograde flow velocity. Uh, and then again, we do look at a small set of static images to mo mainly to um, be able to co-register some of these cell membrane features that we're seeing in live cell imaging with known uh, protein complexes accumulating in the fixed cell images. That allows us to determine about 14 primary biomarkers, phenotypic biomarkers. You can derivatize, add, subtract, multiply, divide those to get up to 600 what we call aggregate biomarkers. But each of these has a dynamic range and, and that's really uh, a key. We, we know what normal looks like and we know what abnormal looks like. When we perform this analysis, the data goes into a um, ensemble of decision trees, which then read out on a per cell basis, whether a cell itself, and we do this cell by cell, is above or below a predictive value for its behavior. And then on aggregate, we take all of those cells and for an individual, uh, deduce whether or not that patient is indeed in uh, above or below a um, set point for true positive or true negative for particular pathologies. And that's a very important point. What you're seeing on the left-hand cluster of reds and blues, each of those um, rows represents a different type of surgical pathology. So, for example, the top row is positive surgical margins. The next one is seminal vesicle invasions. The third one is extra prostatic extension, and on and on. And so at a cell-by-cell -cell basis, we're able to rate two to 5,000 cells and then aggregate that up to the individual level. So what were our results? Um, in the world of clinical diagnostics, the receiver operating curve is a king of the, king of the realm. Uh, that is a way of looking at sensitivity and specificity at the same time. There's always a bit of a trade-off. And the genomic assays that have come out to market thus far uh, clearly are exquisitely sensitive, but their overall performance in terms of area under the curve is at best 70 to 75%, which means that their specificity, uh, is this a worrisome tumor, is below par. Uh, we have been able to demonstrate in prostate cancer on the 40, 57 specimen that we had, um, a strong tendency towards both high specificity and high sensitivity for each of these different markers. And in this slide, the six that are alpha, alpha labeled, A, B, A through F, uh, correspond on the right-hand side to, again, those specific surgical pathologies that we're training on, positive surgical margins, seminal vesicle invasion, prosthetic capsule extension, et cetera. Here's more of the raw data, uh, which shows again for the 50, 57, sorry, 59 specimen that we had, um, how they ranked in terms of sensitivity and specificity, uh, true positives, and true negatives, predicted positives and predicted negatives. These are all uh, exquisitely good. Um, and we're working on ways of combining those features into what we call a general adverse pathology, uh, which is a combination of the local adverse pathology and the metastatic potential. Um, in this two by two graph, if we look at how metastatically potential uh, a tumor is versus uh, uh, the horizontal axis, which is the degree of local abnormality, um, you can plot out specific men on this graph. And as you would expect, you in the lower left-hand corner, uh, or at least in score six, or seven minus are seeing a clustering of those there. And in the upper right, you see Gleason scores in the eight and seven plus range. But what's also notable is how not all Gleason seven minuses are in the lower left. Some are in the upper right. And here we get to the important point that we, with this assay, can now stratify the risk of these patients for having aggressive disease beyond what the Gleason scoring system would tell you. And we've done the same in the breast cancer. Uh, the, obviously, the surgical pathologies that we're looking for are different. 
Uh, we're looking for extra nodal extension, positive surgical margin, ductal carcinoma in situ, lobular carcinoma in situ, et cetera. Um, and here are the raw data on that. Um, and so um, the lap and map uh, mapping of that is, is further behind. It doesn't look quite as pretty, but we, again, are working on a smaller data set of only 47. We've done some early work also with respect to kidney and bladder. So we believe that this is robust across tumor types. The most advanced for us is our prostate work, and that was published in Urology, the journal Urology, um, in 2019. And uh, it was our PC001 study. You've seen this graphic before, so it was the same design. And again, here's our publication, Dr. David Albala. Uh, uh, it was the lead author on this. What we're demonstrating in the box to the lower right is the ability of Gleason in the red to at best get you 65 to 70% predictive accuracy uh, with respect to the tumor when you remove it from the prostate gland. The biopsy Gleason score uh, is only 65% accurate. Genomics gets you to 70% accurate on a good day, and we are at uh, a 86% sensitivity, 96% specificity for an AUC of 0.88. How did we get there? Uh, our study was uh, using 10 sites, uh, which included Cleveland Clinic and Leahy and University of Pennsylvania, Vanderbilt and, and Alabama, uh, Krauss Hospital, um, but also some tissue banks that, and, and cooperative tissue networks. Uh, we had a range of Gleason scores uh, that were returned from the standard pathology that was done in parallel to uh, us working our core specimen. Uh, and so those Gleason scores came back from 6 through 10. Um, uh, we also had various staging, and, and you can see the percentage of cases break, broken out. Uh, a more graphical example is here, where you see that our, uh, in the lower um, middle portion, Gleason 3 plus 4 was 124. Gleason more severe, according to the Gleason, SEP 4 plus 3 was 63. And then we had a smattering of Gleason 8, 9s, and 10s as well, and 65 Gleason 6s. And our results uh, in terms of our being able to run our analysis and then open an envelope and see what the pathologist found on radical prostatectomy, our area on the curve in terms of prediction of perineural invasion was 0.94, lymph node invasion 0.94, lymphovascular invasion 0.90, the lowest score that we got was uh, our generalized adverse pathology potential, which was 0.85, but each of the individual biomarkers that we were attempting to predict were above 0.87, 0.87 or above, uh, which we think is, is remarkably strong. And you can see the positives and negatives, true and false, um, there uh, to the right. Mapping out a, a subset, about a 100 of the uh, individuals for illustrative purposes here. We have color-coded them in terms of the Gleason 3 and 4 versus 4 plus 3 uh, and onwards, um, and how many adverse pathology potentials we predicted. Uh, as you see, um, if we predicted no adverse pathology potentials, um, they're in the lower left, these open boxes and circles. Um, and we had also those who had much higher pathologies, which were clustering in the upper right, so those are the salmon colored ones, as well as the yellows. Uh, so that turns out to be, as we term it, Gleason 3 plus 4 are, are sheep. They're called a Gleason 7, but they're, uh, and they would probably go off to surgery, uh, but they're actually pretty benign. And then we have the Gleason 3 plus 4s who have three adverse pathology potentials in the upper right, and those are very aggressive, we call those wolves, and now we can again risk stratify and differentiate these patients. So on that two by two, we believe that in the lower left, we have active surveillance as a recommendation, in the upper right, prostatectomy. The other two boxes are interesting because they might indicate the need for either adjuvant chemo or local ablation. So in summary, we do have a platform which, um, has been through a proof of concept study using machine vision on primary prostate cells, training machine learning on them and getting excellent results. We are moving forward in our final pre-commercial assay, 
uh, uh, to, to get to um, commercialization. But all, along the way, we're also looking at the halo effect and biochemical recurrence. We also have confidentially uh, on, on the halo effect uh, some early data which shows uh, um, uh, strength in the robustness, whether or not you hit the tumor or are adjacent to it. So again, our, our first study in 251 men was completed with a strong performance. Uh, our PC002 to uh, do this on biopsy specimen, not post-prostatectomy specimen, is uh, scheduled to get under underway now uh, with uh, enrollment in six months on PC003. Um, our platform uh, comprises many elements, as you've seen before. We believe we can answer the question, how aggressive is your cancer and must you treat it now? And uh, we seek to become the standard of care in the evaluation of prostate and then breast and other cancers. Finally, answering the question, is your tumor aggressive or indolent? We have a stellar uh, scientific advisory board led by Dr. Grand of Sant, who uh, was uh, chief of urology at uh, Tufts, and Dr. David Albala, uh, who was the lead author on the study, of course, Dr. Eric Klein at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, leading the, Euro, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Glickman Urological Institute and uh, several other notables and luminaries. Uh, so with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing and get back control of our um, uh, remote uh, screen here. I am going to break here and I believe that we're going to have live question and answer at this point. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to your, your questions and answers. Thank you so much, Guy, for an awesome presentation um, with lots of questions from the audience. So um, let me start with the question that had some discussion here even. So the audience member thought it was a fascinating idea. And then they were wondering if you take samples from non-small cell lung cancer, which has, where the samples have EGFR mutation versus wild type EGFR, they, they were wondering if you're able to recapitulate the response to EGFR um, kinase inhibitors. Um, and they suggest that this could be a good positive control for your approach. Well, great. Thank you for the question. And um, I, I love engaging audiences on this because we, we do get such great thought partners on um, what the potential is of this platform is and where to go. Um, you know, we, we've been focused really on, on trying to get a, a um, risk stratifying um, predictive model uh, established in the clinical setting to eliminate unnecessary surgeries. Uh, currently in prostate cancer, up to 80% of the men who undergo the surgery are later found not to have needed it on final path. Uh, so that's a huge burden. Uh, but you know, we have had others point out that once you have the cells, um, the hard part's over in, in terms of getting and culturing these cells and there are interesting things you can do with them. So yes, I, I, I like the way in which um, our, our thought partners here are working. Uh, we uh, to again want to launch the, the diagnostic platform, but we would fast follow with looking at the therapeutic efficacy. And I, I, I thank them for uh, uh, thinking of this to this point of non small cell lung cancer and EGR, EGFR mutation. Sure, um, uh, appreciate that. And, and whoever's idea it was, happy to cite you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they have the cells, huh? That's so. Right. Another question was, do variations in biopsy sample quality, maybe the collection, the processing protocols, all those things that we know are affecting batch effects as well, do they affect the quality of the final data or the quality of the prediction? Uh, very important question. Um, there are a number of factors that can come into play. Um, we believe that um, some data that is going to be published uh, later this year, um, it's being submitted now, uh, demonstrates uh, an even more difficult question that people ask, which is, you know, if you're doing a prostate biopsy, taking 10, 12, up to 20 different samples in a prostate gland, how are you sure that the one that you have has tumor in it? Um, and it, it turns out, and, and people on this 
conference are very familiar with the concept of field effect, uh, that the whole gland in essence is sick. Um, and, and I think some of the earlier presentations today, Mara Sherman at OHSU uh, was talking about cancer associated fibroblasts creating a tumor microenvironment and, and, and metabolism. Uh, so our data show that if you tweak the algorithm uh, that we have and allow for um, uh, some, some variation, you can actually get very strong indication regardless of whether or not you took the biopsy from the tumor site or from an adjacency. Uh, so that allows us some degree of comfort in, in understanding that the, um, the abnormalities of these cells in this gland is a function of the biology and that the biology is represented across the gland. Uh, and so smaller things like uh, individual variation in, in sample performance um, uh, probably won't have as much of an impact as one might think. Um, but that data is coming out later, later this year. Yeah, awesome, very exciting. In case you do see that the uh, biopsy does not include the tumor in it somehow, can you then use this to recommend a second biopsy? Is that the plan? Uh, again, if it, our, our data, um, when we ran a, the experiment that was published in urology of 250 men, during the last 60 or 70 men in that cohort, um, the question came up about not hitting the tumor. And so our, our PIs were asked to not only submit to us a core of what they suspected to be the tumor, but an adjacent area. Uh, and again, now, now, we, now we had two cohorts. We had tumor suspected 250, uh, plus we also had 70 individual non-tumor uh, specimen. What it required was for us to run the random forest decision tree analysis separate and optimize around the, the um, uh, surgical pathology outcomes that we were trying to predict using the non-tumor cores. Our performance, our AUC uh, on the um, tumor cores what turned out to be uh, approximately 0.88 and on the non-tumor was 0.90, uh, which is it's essentially the same. Uh, but again, it required the algorithm to be tweaked in terms of which biomarkers feature prominently in the decision tree cluster under the random forest. So I, I think we're there. I think we, we, we've answered that question. You'll see the data coming out. Awesome, really looking forward to seeing the data too. And then uh, there was a question regarding the algorithm. So say, did you try beyond random forests, maybe neural network architecture? Great question. Um, this research was uh, stood up on its feet in 2013. Uh, the work was done 2014 through 2016. Um, and at the time, you know, uh, random forest was was cutting edge. Uh, things have caught up since then. Uh, I think the uh, attendees of this session uh, are very much aware of that. So um, we are working with our um, software developer team um, who has converted our original MATLAB random forest <laughs> algorithms to Python, uh, but they've also suggested going into deep learning. So that'll be our next stop. We, we do want to advance our algorithmic basis. Uh, as far as overfitting, you know, the, the sampling that goes on and the averaging under and random forest decision trees does tend to mitigate that. So we're pretty happy that we have an overfit, but we are gonna move in the direction of deep learning. Awesome. Um, will be interesting to see that. So just out of curiosity, how many samples do you look at? I mean, it seems you didn't need that many patients to show proof of principle when you were, were using, you were, when, sorry, you were using the random forest trees. And um, I, I just wonder how many samples do you have if you're gonna move to deep networks? Right, right, good, good questions. You know, um, fortunately on my scientific advisory board is Dr. Enayete, who was former head of the biostats group at the FDA. Uh, and so he's been able to keep us uh, on, on beam with respect to sample size, uh, given the prevalence of the 
of the disease that we are, we're looking for in, in a population. So uh, we were able to back into a sample size of uh, 250 to 300 being appropriate for this stage of analysis. And we're looking to scale up from there. Cool. Uh, how about the number of biomarkers? How many biomarkers do you find are relevant for your prediction? That's a great question. Um, in our uh, nature supplement, uh, we go into great detail about that. There are about 14 primary biomarkers uh, which we're looking at uh, in terms of observed behavior. And to that, we add one or two stain for focal adhesion kinases and the like, mostly for um, uh, correlation. Um, uh, co-registration. But um, once you have the 14 biomarkers, you can sort of multiply and divide and subtract and get up to, you know, hundreds. Uh, presently, we feel about 130 is what is really powering the analysis. But the core 14, of course, are what we're observing directly. Cool. I think one last question. Uh, how would you collect uh, live cells? Do you find that a challenge? Well, the biggest challenge is, is changing the mindset of the physician not to drop whatever they biopsied into formalin. <laughs> That's the, really the big <laughs> After that, you ship it on ice uh, with an ice pack to us overnight, and, and, and then we dissociate and plate that out. So uh, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Awesome. So uh, I'm not sure. I, I think we need to wrap up now. Um, so I would like to thank the audience and I would like to thank my colleagues, um, Rick and Ron and Guy, um, and thank you everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Orly. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.